In this video, we're ultimately going to show that uh, any two intervals, regardless of whether or not they include their endpoints, will have to have the same cardinality. Um, and we already know that uh, the reals are an uncountable set, and that the reals has the, have uh, the same cardinality as 0, 1, the open interval. So if I can show all intervals have the same cardinality, then I'm transitively showing that all intervals are uncountable. So before we get started on that problem, here's a warm-up problem. So suppose that A is countable and that X1 and X2 are two real numbers that are not in our count countable set. What I want to do is prove that if I take A and I add just two more points, X1 and X2, that that doesn't change the cardinality of my set. In particular, um, I will still have a countable set when I'm done. So I recommend pausing the video and trying to see if you can define the map that proves that A, together with these two new points, uh, is a countable set. So the big thing here is, since A is countable, it means we can list its elements out. We can enumerate them. So since A is countable, we can write A equal to A1, A2, A3. This would just be using the bijection that we have <clears throat> from the natural numbers to A itself. That would give us an enumeration of our elements. Now from there, I'm now trying to prove that I have a countable set still, even when I add only two points. So that means I need to define a map that goes from the natural numbers to my new set that has x1 and x2 added in. And we've done a problem like this before. In the activity that we did on Zoom, <clears throat> we had, um, the natural numbers and then we threw in e and we threw in pi. This is just the abstraction of that same problem. So the key there was to take your new values that you're adding to your set and put them at the beginning and then pick up where you left off. Now I'm not trying to, in this case, I'm not trying to hit natural numbers. I'm trying to hit all the numbers in the set a. And so I am going to do a one here, a two. A3 because I want to make sure that my map is an onto map specifically for the set A union with X1, X2. So if I wanted to write this down, I could say I'm creating a bijection from the natural numbers to A union A1, or sorry, X1, A2, X2. by, if I plug in f of n, that's going to be x sub n, if n equals 1 or 2. Like if I plug in 1, that's going to go to x1. If I plug in 2, that should go to x2. Um, and other than that, it goes to a n minus 2 if n is greater than or equal to 3, because then I need to cover my tracks there and hit all of the values in um, the set A. So F is a bijection. Therefore, A union X1, X2 is countable. So that was the warm up, but now we want to answer this other question. How does this process work if you add finitely many elements to an uncountable set? We expect that when you have a, uh, a set with infinitely many elements in it and you just add, say, two more numbers to it, um, that that shouldn't increase the uh, cardinality of your set. It should still have the same cardinality because you're not, you know, you're not increasing it by a high enough order. So, um, What's the issue here if I am trying to add to an uncountable set? Why is this problem harder than the one that we just did? 
well, the issue is that we can't enumerate the elements. So how am I gonna just absorb my new points? Before I was able to enumerate my elements and I just shifted them over and I put X1 first, then X2, and then I continued labeling. But uncountable sets cannot be denoted A1, A2, A3, etc. So let me write that down. So we can't enumerate the elements. So how do you, quotes, absorb the new points? <clears throat> well, when you have an uncountable set, any it is possible to look at a subset of it that is countable. Because remember, uncountable is just a step bigger than countable. So you could enumerate um, a countable subset of those elements and use that to absorb the new points. But then you have to worry about what about the other values that I didn't uh, list in my enumeration? What do I do with those? So to see how this works, we're gonna do an example. So we are going to prove that if I take um, 0, 1, and I include it, that will have the same cardinality as the open interval 0, 1. So here I'm thinking of, um, this is my kind of like my set A, and I'm thinking of it as, I'm gonna, sorry, this is my new set. My set A is kind of like the open interval 0, 1, and I'm gonna throw in two more points and I'm trying to say that doesn't change the size of my set. And so as I was saying, um, we know that zero one is an uncountable set. So the issue is this guy is uncountable. So we can't just enumerate its elements, but we can take a countable subset of that interval and work with that instead. So here's the idea of how we're gonna approach this problem. Use a countable subset of zero one to absorb zero and one, the new points, like the previous example. So here, zero and one are playing the role of X1 and X2 from our previous example. But then that begs the question, what do you do with the other elements? Because if I only deal with a countable subset of the open interval from zero to one, then there's gonna be a whole bunch of elements that aren't part of that subset that also need to be mapped somewhere. So the first thing here is Let's worry about what we do with the other elements later. For now, let's just think about um, how can I get a countable subset of the open interval zero one. Now, I argue there are all kinds of choices for how you can define um, a countable subset. In fact, there are infinitely many choices. Um, but I'm gonna be clever and I'm going to use a result that we already uh, know from the previous video. If you have the rational numbers, the rational numbers are a countable set. So any subset of the rationals that still has infinite cardinality will also have to be countable. You can't suddenly be uncountable by throwing out elements. If you can enumerate all of the elements, then you can enumerate an infinite subset of those elements. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna let our set A be all of the rationals in the interval 0, 1. So I'm using intersection here to denote that. So A is countable since Q is countable. And infinite subsets 
of countable sets must also be countable. So the fact that it's countable tells me I can take the set A, which is Q intersect zero one, and instead I could write that as A1, A2, A3. I'm able to enumerate its elements. Now I don't know what the actual values are of A1, A2, A3. That would depend on the bijection that I'm working with. But I do know that it has to exist. So this is kind of like a non-constructive existence proof. Now, my goal now, remember what I'm trying to do. I want to define a bijection that goes from the open interval zero one to the closed interval zero one. So the first thing I'm going to do is remember, I'm starting with this open interval zero one, I have to somehow create a way to put the number zero into that set and the number one into that set without changing the cardinality, which means I'm gonna have to take points from my open interval and figure out how to map those to zero and to one, but still hit everything else. So the way we can do this is we take our countable subset, which is A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, I'll write out enough of that. And we need to send these all somewhere. Well, remember what we did before. We said, take your new numbers that you need to hit in your uh, codomain, so zero and one in this case. And then if you wanna make sure that um, all of the A's are still hit under this, because remember these A's are numbers in, in the interval zero one, and so they need to be outputs under this map if I'm going to have an onto map. So I'm gonna send A3 to A1, A4 goes to A2. I'm basically just covering my tracks. So I'm borrowing A1 and A2 to, to hit those new points, and then I'm shifting my list over and continuing to enumerate so that I still hit everything. Now, what I've managed to do so far is I've only defined my map on the values for the set, uh, for that countable subset A in my domain. But what about all the numbers in the interval zero one that weren't listed in that enumeration? Where do those go? So let me write that question out. So we have mapped all values in A somewhere. What about values not in A, but in 0, 1? Where should they go? Well, that's all the irrationals, right? So where should irrationals go? Um, so we're gonna do the irrationals intersect with zero one. Well, right now, our mapping as we've defined it, because we defined it on A the way we, we, that we did, we have guaranteed that our output um, is hitting the number zero, one, and then every rational number in the, in the interval zero, one. So now we need to make sure we hit all the irrationals. So the simple solution is to just send every irrational in zero, one to itself. That's the way I make sure my map is onto. Um, and it's defined for all numbers in the interval zero one. If it's rational, we use this map up here. If it's an irrational number, we just send it to itself. And under this, uh, we've hit all of the elements and we've hit all the elements exactly once in the closed interval zero one. That's the definition of a bijection. So for X in zero one, 
we're going to define f of x, it's piecewise. We said what we get is just x when x is irrational. It's going to go to 0 if the x we plug in is a1. Because remember, look at our map. a1 goes to 0, a2 goes to 1. So it's going to be 1 if x is a2. And then all of my others, if x is an a n, where n is greater than or equal to 3, you're just going to drop its subscript by two values. So a3 goes to a1, a4 goes to a2. So this should go to a n minus 2 if x equals a n, where n is greater than or equal to 3. So then I could do this process for any interval I want. Um, there's always going to be, if I have an open interval a, b, and I want to map that to a closed interval c, d, uh, I can just map a, b to c, d, the open intervals, using a line, a straight line. And then I could absorb the two new points using an argument similar to what I just showed here. So an important fact that can be extended from what we just saw and I'm not going to prove this, but you can use it. Um, you might want to try and prove it yourself. All intervals have the same cardinality. Regardless of whether they contain their endpoints. In particular, they are uncountable. So for example, I could take an interval of the form AB and that would be the same cardinality as what if I included C but excluded D. I would only have one point that I would need to absorb in showing that this works. Um, what I think would be a good practice for you to do after you finish watching this video is to go and make yourself a list of what are all the sets we know that are countable and what are all the sets we know that are uncountable, just so you have those on hand as you're thinking through other problems that you're going to be working on in this class. Um, and then one more thing I want to say is that um, we want to, we've started working with like we've said something about Q and we've said something about R. We know that Q is countable and we know that R is uncountable. We have not answered the question about the irrationals. So is I countable or uncountable? Which one is it? I would pause your video and ask yourself, what do you think? The answer to this question is that I is uncountable. If I were to be countable, so if it were countable, then taking R, that would be the union of a count of two countable sets. And one of the results you're proving in your homework this week is that the union of countable sets is again countable. This would be countable, so we'd be saying that the reals are a countable set since it's the union of countable sets. And that's a contradiction because we've already proven that R is uncountable.